Software Engineering Radio, episode 106, Introduction to Aspect-Oriented Programming. This is Software Engineering Radio, the podcast for professional developers, on the web at se-radio.net. SE Radio brings you relevant and detailed discussions and interviews on software engineering topics every 10 days. Thanks to our audience and the partners listed on our website for supporting the podcast. In contrast to some other episodes, we have two women and only one male person on this episode. And uh, there is another specialty and that is that we have two Austrians and only one non-Austrian. So we have, this is very special. Um, apart from that, we're going to talk about aspect orientation, aspect oriented software development. A very female thing. Why? Because there are a lot more women dealing with in this to with this topic than men, I think. Yeah, that's probably. interesting. Uh, if you look at the, or at least the percentage of women is higher than for you know other topics in computer science currently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I noticed that. I just wondered why this is the case. But uh, listeners, in, in case you wonder who, whose voice this was, so uh, this was Christa Schwanninger. Do you want to introduce yourself uh, briefly? Uh, yeah, my name is Christa Schwanninger. I'm working for Siemens and I'm doing a little research also in aspect-oriented software development. That's a topic we in our research team are here are interested because of the implications on architecture this might have. Okay. And uh, the other voice you might have heard laughing in the beginning was Iris Grohr, so you maybe want to talk a little bit about you briefly. Hi, uh, my name is Iris Grohr and I'm a PhD student at the University of Linz and I'm working here at Siemens. I'm employed here as a PhD student and the topic of my work is product line engineering um, uh, in connection to, to aspect-oriented software development. So both of you have, have quite some experience with aspects and that's why uh, we kind of assembled in that group today. Um, just uh, before we get started, one, one more comment. We've had another episode where we interviewed Gregor Kichales or whatever he, how to, whatever, I don't know really how to pronounce his last name, Kichales, Kichales, whatever. So um, that was more of, more or less an overview, of, like opinions from the guru, whereas uh, this episode is, uh, well, I shouldn't Opinion say. from the women. <laughs> <laughs> or opinion from the street. Yeah, it's, it's intended as a, as a real introduction to the topic. So we try to step through uh, AOSD systematically and, and not like we did last time. So if you if you haven't heard the Kisales interview yet, you should first listen to this one and then listen to the interview with Gregor. If, if we talk about aspect orientation, then, then people often talk about the uh, separation of concern. Do you want to explain a little bit what a concern is? So a concern is anything somebody is interested in. Mm -hmm. A concern can be something the user of a system is interested in, something the developer is interested in, or something the person who's paying for software development is interested mm -hmm. in. If, if, you look, if you talk about AOP, then people always talk about cross-cutting concerns. What's, what's, what's the cross-cutting thing about it? Uh, a cross-cutting concern is a concern that cannot be easily cast into one entity in the solution space. So it's not localizable. It's not localizable. It's not per se because it's not possible to localize it as a concern possibly, but since there are some major concerns that typically are functional concerns that are mapped to the solution space first, and then there are some concerns you know, that come after these major concerns. Such as? Such as security, persistency. Often they are non-functional concerns. Because yeah. typically you deal with the functional concerns first, and then you try to get in the non-functional concerns. Yeah. And, and those concerns then often cannot be modularized that well anymore because there is something already you did and you have there and those concerns cross cut the things that are there and therefore are hard to modularize. I don't say that you can't modularize, you know, security in some okay. modules or subclasses like authentication yeah, manager, class yeah, or yeah, manager. Yeah. Yeah. But nevertheless, the, the places where authentication and plays a role in your software mm -hmm. are many, and not only the authentication manager itself. So, so you say even although you might be able to modularize the algorithm that manages the authentication, calling that algorithm is scattered through the system. Yeah. It sounds to me a little bit that that's a limitation of the underlying language. I mean, um, object orientation has this one decomposition hierarchy, also called, I think, the, the tyranny of the dominant, dominant decomposition. So, so, so is, is AOP to some extent a fix 
that, 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 that tries to fix the shortcomings of object-oriented programming? So um, I wouldn't say so. So that the tyranny of the dominant decomposition is just the fact that you, you start with some um, functional concerns you want to modularize, and then you start decomposing them in some way, in an object-oriented way, for example, and then some, some other concerns arise, or there are often non-functional concerns yeah. you want to modularize in addition, and then those do not fit well into um, the decomposition you have chosen from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And then there are special effects called scattering and tangling. Yeah, can, can you explain what the difference between those are? I always mix them up. So, so scattering is when one concern is, is implemented in, in several modules. So the implementation of, of this one concern, the, the cross-cutting concern, is, is scattered over, over um, many places of your object-oriented hierarchy, for example. So entangling means that in one module of your ah. hierarchy, there are, one module of your hierarchy basically implements more than, than one concern. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's more or less the same, but yeah. looked at from a different point of view, right. uh -huh. either from the concern or from you know one other well modularized thing in your solution space. Okay, so uh, I think we agree that the whole point of AOP and aspect oriented software development is to come to the rescue here to 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 help us get out of this this problem. So. Um, can you maybe very briefly, like in two or three sentences, say what, what aspects do and what they are? And then we can look at the different like passwords, join point, point cut, and all that stuff. So, so an aspect is just a module, like, like a class, but that has a special purpose. And its purpose is to, to modularize those so-called cross-cutting concerns. And an aspect can contain, like a class, can contain members and operations, but special kinds of things, sh such as point cuts and advices. OK. So let's maybe uh, define those um, terms and, and explain what they mean. First, we probably have to explain that you know when you modularize a cross-cutting concern, that doesn't mean it's not cross-cutting anymore. The concern per se still cross-cuts the rest of your okay. system, yeah. Yeah. and that's why we need some special you know means to to make this aspects happen, and those means are for example, point cuts that help you defining where in your source code this cross-cutting concerns interacts with the rest of the system. So with, a, with a base program, as with it's the, called. I think. Yeah, you can say base program or primary, concern. primary concerns. Since it still is cross-cutting, you have to specify those points where it cross-cuts the rest of the system, and that's where this point cuts come in. Mm -hmm. To be able to specify a point cut, you first need a concept of those points in your system you want to interact with. That's called a join point. So, so let, me, let me briefly try to, to say that in, in different words. In some sense, I think a point cut is a query over a running program. Exactly. You, you say you have some points in your program you're interested in that are called join points, so yeah. points where you join in the aspect, yeah. and the point cut picks all the points you're interested in for one specific concern or one yeah. specific part of a concern. Okay. So uh, the other two terms are advice then and the aspect itself. So the aspect itself is the module, and the module uh, captures own members or operations, but also point cuts and advices. And the point cuts, as we already said, um, select the points where you want to add additional functionality. Yep. And this additional functionality is then defined in the advice. So that's the additional things you want to execute at so, those so points. So it's a piece of code, a piece, of, a piece behavior of behavior code, right. that you apply to the base program at places or, well, at places that are selected by the point cut. That's right, yeah. So in a language that's not aspect-oriented, the position of the statement normally determines when it's executed. Yeah. But in an aspect-oriented language, it's a bit different because in the module you define external to, to your base code where things should happen and, and what should happen at those points. Uh, critics often say that, that, that to some extent uh, AOP is just a way of tweaking code. Like you can do like bytecode manipulation in Java, but but what you really do in really good aspect languages is that you don't you don't specify where something should happen, but rather when. So a join point is is an basically it's a piece or a place in the execution of a program, not a source code location. Is that is that a relevant distinction or is that more or less picky? 
No, that's absolutely relevant, this distinction, because you're not interested in, you know, changing your source code to some extent, but you're interested in in points in the in the control flow on the runtime mm -hmm. of your program where, cert, where certain conditions are true, and yeah. you want to be, you know, as specific what these conditions are as possible. Mm -hmm. So typically in aspect-oriented language that are used nowadays, you you use nevertheless lexical elements to specify yeah. those points. So program structure is a means of defining that point. Let's make that concrete. If you want something to happen after another method has executed, then this after method has executed is basically that's a point in the execution. But a way of implementing that thing is to do something in the code after the method has been called. Exactly, exactly. And the the more powerful your point cut language mm -hmm. is, the easier it is to find the logical points or to define the logical yeah. points in the control flow of your application where something should apply. Yeah. This can be anything from, you know, do something when a method is called up to do something when my program goes into a specific state and yeah. the state is a very complicated thing that considers historical information in your application, yeah. data flow information on yeah. your application, whatever you can think yeah. of. And we'll, we'll talk about this joint point model and the point cuts later in more detail. But um, to, to, to finish this discussion about, about the, the basics of AOP, um, there are, we already mentioned implicitly, something happens after, before, around. There are these different kinds of advice. Do you want to elaborate a little bit on those? In the aspect-oriented language, aspect J, that is maybe the most famous one. And yeah. an aspect -orient, it's an aspect-oriented language that is based on Java. There are three different kinds of advices. So there is the before advice. That's um, code that is executed before a point cut matches. Then there is the after advice that is executed after a certain point cut matches. And there is the around advice. So the ad around advice can execute code um, before as well as after. Or even instead. Even instead, that's right. Yeah. So and, and of course, if you have an after advice, then in the, uh, in the well, you do have access to the return value, for example, if it's a method call. So, so if the if the if the join point or so let's say if the point cut mo modifies the state of something, then of course in an after advice you have access to that changed state. Yeah, you you can have access to the to the whole context yeah. basically. Yeah. Okay, so so then let's look at uh, a couple of typical examples for using aspect-oriented programming, mm. and there is the the general ubiquitous example of logging, I guess, and then there is hopefully more more useful stuff. So. Um, do you want to provide a couple of examples? Yeah, so logging is the typical hello world example, like for objects, GUI objects were the, you know, starting point for object-oriented programming. Everybody could imagine that a window and a button is an object. But people had hard time to, to see that something like, like a symbol in a compiler could be an object. Mm -hmm. So this changed in the last 20 years, I think, Still, AO is in a stage where a lot of people think, you know, logging is what you can do with aspect orientation, but mm -hmm. that's that's definitely not the case. So why 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 is it that logging is this hello world? What's so simple about logging that it's this kind of introductory example? If you do logging really simple without thinking about it, you could do something like, you know, at every like like tracing at every entrance or exit of an or a method, yeah. you write, I entered this method and I now leave this method yeah. again. Uh, for, for tip for real logging problems, this would be a lot too simplistic. And we we already had cases where we said no, we don't want to use aspect J for logging because mm -hmm. if you want to have meaningful <laughs> yes. outputs for logging, you rather you know write the logging statement yeah. dedicated to the point where yeah. you want to log. So, because that's the point. If you do it with an aspect, what you do is of course you factor out the logging functionality, system out print line something into the aspect. And then, of course, this aspect needs to be generic in some way so that you can reattach it to all these different points. Yeah, and we had, the, for example, the one thing in an application we wrote where we first wanted to use aspects for logging. We had the problem that, you know, the logging output is not meaningful at all because you're not interested in, you know, method exits and, and, and entrances, yeah. but you're interested in, you know, something is accomplished now some meaningful mm -hmm. message, yeah, yeah. and then you write an aspect where you know you probably own, the only thing you really 
uh, encapsulate there is the fact that you do logging somewhere. Yeah. But for yeah. every point in your source code, you'd have a different advice because the message you want to, to is print is different. So logging is definitely not a very good example for an aspect. Right. Really, tracing is different. Tracing where you only want to know or profiling or something like yeah, this. Yeah, collecting you execution are. data. Yeah, th yeah. there it's, it's perfect, yeah. of course. So, and the trick is, of course, that um, if you have an aspect then, or if you write an advice, I should say, then you do have information to some meta characteristics. So you maybe you know you can you can ask the join point. So the join point object object is typically represented as an object in the advice. So you can query it. What's the name of the method I'm just entering? Yeah. So so you, you have access to the meta level to some extent. You of course have information about uh, the environment of the point you, you trapped. Yeah, Let's yeah. say it that way. That's yeah, a good a good term, trapping, by the way. Uh, yeah. No, people know this from 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 other uh, IT areas. A trap is something that fires if something happens. Yeah. So it's a good a good good analogy analogy. And, and and there you can get the information about the calling object, typically about the caller, about parameters. So if everything you might be interested in, that that is relevant for this one point and then you of course can do things with those you can change parameters mm -hmm. you can call other methods from one of the two mm -hmm. from the caller or the callee mm -hmm. uh, whatever is necessary at that point okay so if if logging um, is not a good example and tracing is very simplistic what then uh, what else can we say about uh, typical examples for for AOP people often talk about technical versus functional concerns so that's true. So it's often the case that technical concerns are implemented as aspects. What, what is a technical concern? Basically a non-functional concern. What is a non-functional concern? <laughs> a non-functional concern that is, is something that, that's not related to the business domain. Okay. And that doesn't implement business functionality. So examples include security, persistence, caching, for example, or also consistent error handling is something that's all often implemented mm -hmm. as an aspect. Mm -hmm. So it's, of course, also possible to, to use aspects to implement business concerns. But to find a good example is always hard because it's as hard to, to find a good example for a business aspect as to find one typical example for a business object. So yeah. It's also funny, for example, one, one, one I think, cross-cutting business aspect could be billing. Yes. So you somehow look at the resources a specific method works with, for example, some kind of whatever, an MP3 file that you download or whatever, and, and then you, you can weave the billing concern in. But the funny thing is that I have the impression that as soon as things are cross-cutting, people say, ah, oh, well, but that's not really business logic. That's more or less technical in our domain. So uh, we once implemented a demonstrator that um, was about a topological tree. Mm -hmm. And we've implemented the, the error propagation what as is an a aspect. topological tree? So that's basically a tree of, of hardware nodes. Oh, and oh, oh, hardware topology. So okay. yeah, right. So um, if one node fails, for example, or reports an error, so this error is then propagated to, to top nodes. Yep. And the propagation strategy was something that we implemented as an aspect, for example, and we mm -hmm. could then easily exchange between different propagation strategies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that, that's, that's, that's obviously an example business. Of yeah. Business, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the thing here is, again, that... Um, when you think of uh, typical aspects, then you think of things that have been modularized or people tried to modularize before because they very often had the problem that they had a concern that should not pollute the rest of the system. Yeah. When we look at, you know, for example, J2E component containers yes, or yes. other component containers yes. or even at Corba, there are these... Yeah services there interceptors and also right interceptors yeah there were things that you know always polluted business objects they were yep. needed a lot so i like the distinction between um, an application domain and a software domain jan bosch made this in one of his books and, and the application domain has to do with your business yeah. while the software domain is something that's uh, in the solution space and we deal with such software domains like persistency in databases like yeah. user interfaces in so many different domains yeah. that we know how to, to handle them and we know how to you know handle persistency and therefore it's possible or it was possible in component containers already yes. to to implement them in a way such that they can be reused for 
most business applications, for example. It's interesting that you bring this up because um, some people say, well, but interceptors, you know, like AOP on framework level isn't really AOP because it has been there all the time and that's not really what we want to and do. The problem was there all the time. Yeah. So it would be sad if AOP would have to invent its own problems. <laughs> but the, the problem of those cross-cutting concerns that happened to be those software concerns is there for long and people had to solve it. Yeah. And to make you know infrastructure and business code reusable, they had to be dragged out, out yeah. Yeah. into their own modules that were happened then to be services yeah. in that container yeah. which, which is which is good and great and nobody needs to call this aspect oriented programming yeah, as long as it's useful <laughs> as long as it's useful i mean aop has some advantages above this since there is of course some overhead when you have a container and you intercept something and then you yeah. look up what concerns or what services should be applied at that point. This all takes time. If you could handle this with an aspect that's woven at compile time, yep. then a lot of runtime yep. overhead goes away. Yep. To some extent, you could say that that's an implementation detail. That's an implementation detail. Yeah. We'll, we'll talk hand, about these details later, by the way. Yeah, on the other hand, I mean, it's, it, it's simply the concept. So nobody would modularize something, only you know one business case needs in yeah. a component container. Yeah. So you couldn't right. buy such a component container that offers you such a concern. So, so it's all about, used. about economics. Only it's things that are used all over the place would be factored out into a container. Exactly, exactly. And with aspects, you simply identify the things on your own mm -hmm. and implement them as aspects and have all these mechanisms at hand that let you easily bring them together with your mm -hmm. base code. Mm -hmm. Very good point, yeah. I think uh, the next thing we need to discuss is the join point model. Um, so it's basically the, the granularity of where you can trap <laughs> the program, right? So it seems like uh, the finer the join point model, the more you can do with your aspect language. So the join point model seems very important. Yeah, the join point model is basically defines what you can do with this aspect-oriented language. So there are different approaches. So there are approaches that only allow you to, to basically intercept the public interfaces of, of some components, but there are also languages that allow you to do very fine-grained manipulation. So it depends on your needs. So the more fine-grained your join point model is, the more you can do with it, but the more you can do wrong, of course, as well. Yeah. So what you're saying is that there are like the typical classical interceptor frameworks, such as Corba, where you can only, if, if, a, if a component is, is invoked, you can basically intercept that invocation. So how, how does uh, SBECJ go further than that? I mean, what kind of additional, more fine-grained join points do you have there? So in SBECJ, there is also something we didn't talk about yet that's um, introductions. Yeah. So what you also can do in SBECJ is you, you can introduce um, new members or new operations into existing classes, and you can even change the class hierarchy. Change a new superclass or something. Right, so you can make classes implement um, mm -hmm. certain interfaces, and you can extend classes from others, uh, have, have classes extend from others that didn't do it before. Mm -hmm. So that's called static cross-cutting. Okay, because it happens, it, it changes the structure. It really changes the structure, the structure of your code. It's not just changing the code to simulate intercepting some point in the execution, it really changes the code. That's right, so it really changes the code. And the, the dynamic things you can do in, in aspect chase, for example, you can, um, there are different join points such as method calls or method execution. So, so what's the, the difference between the execution and the call join point? So the difference is um, the context. So in a call join point, you're at the caller side. So you have access to, to the context of, of the caller. So who calls a method? Who calls a method, right. And with the execution uh, join point, it's, it's different. So you're then at the callee side. So you have access to, to the context of, of the one that's been called. OK. So that's interesting, because if you have the classical interceptor-based thing, then you typically know it's basically a, an execution point cut. It's not, as e not so easy to. To, to find out about the call of a program because the, the typical interceptor doesn't know where the object comes from because you don't have that meta information at the, at the point where you call if you do classical interceptors. That's right. So in aspect J, you, you've got both things available. Mm -hmm. There is other thing like object creation, object destruction, variable assignment, right? 
That's right. So you can also define uh, point cuts that, that select um, certain uh, constructor calls or also uh, read accesses to certain variables mm -hmm. or write accesses to, to certain variables. Is that useful? I mean, I wonder whether it's good practice to, to, to fiddle around with a running program on that low level of detail or whether you shouldn't say that, that, that you know, like you want to restrict um, uh, uh, the, the interception that an aspect does on, on more architectural levels, such as method calls, method execution. It depends a lot on, on what you want to do, of mm -hmm. course. Uh, for many systems, it might be okay to tackle the problem on the interface level, you know, only being able to intercept public interfaces, mm -hmm. for example. Mm -hmm. But depending on the cross-cutting concerns, you need to modularize. It might make sense to be more invasive. Mm -hmm. you, you have to think of, of the problem as being, you know, the cross-cutting concern is in the source code. Mm -hmm. And even mm -hmm. if you don't modularize it, it, it's still there. And, you know, there is, there is a, a nice article by Gregor Kisales and Miro Messini who talk about breaking encapsulation, you know. Yeah, that's one of these what people criticize. It breaks all the nicely done encapsulation by hacking around in details. Yeah, but on the other hand, if the cross-cutting concern has to be implemented in, because it's tangled with your mm. base mm. concern, then it is simply there and mm. it breaks encapsulation. And why not modularize it and make it obvious that it is there? It might be that you want to change it and fiddling around in the code of your base concern to change the cross-cutting concern is not easy either. Mm -hmm. So rather have it modularized and have it easily changeable mm -hmm. if you need this. If you don't need it, if you write a program and you never touch it afterwards again, it probably is not, you know, you don't care. Unless it runs and does what it should, you don't care about modularization yeah, yeah. at all. Only if you want to evolve it, if you want to understand it later on, then you care about those things. It's a very good point. So the motivation for AOP is the ability to be able to reuse either the base program because it's now free of technical crap or uh, the aspects because you want to be able to apply them to different program, program base programs. This can be one concern why you do it. You can have, have other concerns. Such you, as? You, you can say you want to, you know, evolve it and understand it better what's in there mm -hmm. not only reuse it but you know only use it in the context you have it yeah. but be able to change it when you need to change it for example or you, you, you could have something like a cross-cutting concern in a product family that varies yeah and then you want to have two variations of this one concern yeah. and you don't want to have you know two variations of 10 classes only because this concern goes through yeah. those 10 classes but you'd rather have two aspects and then you exchange them when so, you have to vary in, also instead of having all kinds of if defs in the code or if if this variant then else this variant that then you can have different aspects one per variant and either weave the one or weave the other two days ago we had a visitor from the University of Erlangen, yeah. Olaf Schwinzig, who showed an example of the ECOS operating system. And there is it, it, this operating system is highly configurable. It's more mm -hmm. or less an operating system family. family. Yeah. And he showed one function there. So it's implemented in, in, in C++ yeah. or in C even. There is a lot of conditional compilation in it. Yeah. Every, you know, uh, uh, there are a lot of cross-cutting concerns. He showed yeah. one example of a method. And I think that the, the method had 23 lines of code. Only two lines of the code were the business concerns, <laughs> and the rest were cross-cutting concerns, all with, you know, if this the... nice if defs. Wow. Having such a thing modularized, really, with aspects, in this example, it's aspect C++. Yeah, so Olaf Pintig is the, the developer of aspect Olaf C++. Olaf is the developer of, yeah. uh, I don't know, he, he not alone. But yeah, but he's kind of the guy. He's kind of the guy who is uh, leading this development. Yeah. And it looks a lot nicer if you can have those things modularized. Yeah. You, you won't understand the base code with all the if defs. Yeah easily yeah. and it's a lot easier to have this aspect so aspect oriented product line engineering sounds like an interesting research topic <laughs> definitely we should do something along that line <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so there is another uh, point cut that i always found a little bit hard to understand in the beginning and it's called flow c flow below what's that stuff so this point cut more or less takes the stack into account so you can express something like i want to do something at that point when some other method 
from some arbitrary other object was called before. So I look at the stack when the other method was called before and I'm in the control flow of this other method, mm -hmm. I want to do something. So that's really dynamic. That's not something you can easily do with, with static code weaving. You really, really need to look during the runtime of the program is this other method or this other whatever method yeah, typically in the, in the call stack of the current execution path? Right, right. That's really, that you dynamically uh, find out if this condition holds. There are other things you can do with aspect J that, you know, can, can question other things dynamically, but C flow is, is one typical thing you want to see. There are other things like uh, data flow join points, for example, mm -hmm. in What's other that? languages that, consider, you know, a data item, when the data item was, pro the same data item was processed or the same object. Mm -hmm. And you might also be able to maybe set like traps on if a specific variable gets that value then. Yeah, probably like this, right. or if a specific variable was operated on with some other operation before or mm -hmm. things like mm -hmm. this. So mm -hmm. you, you can do a whole lot of things. There are research languages like Alpha is one of those research languages that consider everything uh, that do a, a data flow and, and control flow analysis before the program runs. Mm -hmm. And then you even can take things into account that predict what could happen at some future time, mm -hmm. <laughs> seen from the point of, of, of time you are in in, the, in, your, um, in your program right yeah, now, yeah, 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 and yeah. then do something bringing together all the information you possibly can have about your program uh -huh. and could have calculated before or at runtime. So uh -huh. that's an experimental language that's definitely not very runtime efficient. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but it gives a lot of room for experimenting with joint point models yeah. and with those kinds of, yeah. of, of point cuts. Okay, so I think there is another term we, not, we need to discuss, and that is uh, symmetric versus asymmetric. Um, uh, AOP. Um. We often talked about today about uh, a base program and an aspect, and that's basically what, what asymmetric AO is all about. So, so there's one dedicated base program. There is one dedicated, mainly object-oriented yeah. base program and, and an aspect that cross-cuts um, many places of, of your object-oriented hierarchy. So yeah. aspect J is a very famous example mm -hmm. of a language that's an asymmetric AO language. Mm -hmm. And symmet Trick languages work different, so they, they implement all concerns in separation, no matter if they are cross-cutting or not. Mm -hmm. And at the end, they, they get composed together. Mm -hmm. So HyperJ was a very yeah. famous example. You say was, is it still around? So <laughs> it's, it's, it's not uh, developed currently. I yeah. think they, they stopped it. Yeah. So they started a project called CME, Concern Manipulation Environment. Which is also not very much I heard think so, of. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you, one could argue that the asymmetric symmetric AOP has kind of won. Well, I think it's, it's much easier to start with because the symmetric thing requires a whole new way of thinking. So mm -hmm. You, you've developed software, when you, when you develop software in an object-oriented way, you, you still do it when you use asymmetric AO languages. You just encapsulate your, your cross-cutting concerns as aspects and weave them back in. But if you use a symmetric language, you, you have to think in, in a completely different way. So mm -hmm. you have to develop all your concerns completely in isolation mm -hmm. and really think about how, how to compose them. Such a much more radical approach in some yeah, sense. Yeah, that's true. Since we're already talking about the, the terminology, there is another pair of words, which is a heterogeneous aspect versus homogeneous aspect. When you think of, of logging, for example, which is a bad example we already <laughs> talked of, so, so let's say tracing, you do the same thing all over again. You more or less, when you write an aspect, can you know live with one or two advices and then nevertheless uh, target a, a thousand points in your program. And you do always the same thing that mm -hmm. is printing out uh, the, me the method name yep. and the parameters. Yep. So this is quite homogeneous, I'd say. So if you do the same thing at many places, that's homogeneous. Yeah. Then, of course, you can have other kinds of cross-cutting things. Uh, a very good example for explaining this is the subject-observer pattern. Right. So you have several uh, subjects, probably, in your object graph, and you have, let's say, one observer. Mm -hmm. The logic 
of the observer and the logic of the sub subjects that would be added by the aspects is not the same, so mm -hmm. it's heterogeneous. Yeah. So you have to do two different things, advise the observer and advise the subject. The subject with, with, with different logic right. to make yeah. this protocol yeah. happen. Yeah. And that's called then a heterogeneous aspect. Because and it changes two different places with different advice. Not to say that there can't be, you know, a thousand different classes that play the subject, but mm -hmm. nevertheless, mm -hmm. you have differentiation of things you do, different things at different yeah. places. I, I get the impression that many of the typical technical concerns we talked about are probably homogeneous and they can easily be, easily be factored into a library and applied to all kinds of systems, whereas some of the more business-oriented functional aspects are probably more heterogeneous. Probably. I myself would say I don't have enough experience with this because I can mm. probably think of very homogeneous business concerns and yeah. very heterogeneous uh, infrastructure concerns. So if it feels right, but we can't prove right, it. It feels right, but we can't prove it yeah. yet. Yeah. Probably in five years okay. we can get a proper answer to this. Okay. Before we go to the implementation technologies, I think one of the like, hallmarks of, of AOP is this thing called quantification which is this query that selects a number of points to do something, which then goes back to this more or less homogeneous, homogeneous thing. So um, I, I, I've heard people say that that is the difference to some of the other code tweaking approaches, but that only a, a remark. So let's look at implementation technologies for, for AOP. That P is important. We'll see why this is important in, in a minute. Um, so there are different ways of how this interception of program behavior can actually be made to work. So uh, in connection to, to AOP, you always talk about something that's called weaving. Mm -hmm. And right. that's basically the mechanism how, how you bring things together again, because uh, you separate your cross-cutting concern in an aspect, but you have to get it back in then again. And weaving um, can be done on, on different levels. And it's often called weaving even if it's not really weaving, because you can also generate a proxy, for example. But you could weave at a different level. So you, you could weave your source code, you, you could weave some, some intermediate code, such as, as the bytecode, Java bytecode, for example. You, you could also weave your binaries. Mm -hmm. There are uh, some research uh, projects that, for example, uh, bring AO even into the VM. So mm -hmm. the VM is supporting yeah. AO then. So, but all of these approaches you just mentioned are what you'd call static weaving because some artifact, bytecode, machine code, source code is actually changed. That's true, but, but when the VM, for example, supports it, it's definitely dynamic. So, but in addition to these, uh, to these static possibilities, there are also other ways. For example, I know that small talk, um, if you talk to small talkers, they think sometimes, you know, aspect orientation isn't really special because they've had more or less meta object protocols for ages and they could change the meta class to implement before and after behavior. The same is true for CLOS, for example, the, the Lisp object system, or even today in Ruby, where you can do a lot of these things with, with meta programming. So there is no changing of code in the sense that code is manipulated, but rather you change the runtime system in some sense. That's also where uh, ASD came from with Gregor Kitalis first right. working on meta um, object protocols. The thing there is, you know, you can do so many things and it's not easy to, to wrap your mind around those languages yeah. and, and, and changing more or less your languages at runtime is not what the average programmer does every day. Well, except if you're a Ruby programmer. Yeah, probably, <laughs> but not every program is a Ruby programmer. Yes. So there's still, yeah. you know, <laughs> programmers that program in um, COBOL today and they do not change the languages usually. Yeah. I don't know there's an aspect, if there is an aspect <laughs> couple, but nevertheless, uh, this you know, aspect languages try to bring this, uh, you know, changes, this cross-cutting concerns in as, you know, a deliberate programming model that helps you model solving right. a problem, yeah. modularizing yeah. a cross-cutting concern yeah. and not changing your program at runtime or whatever things you might want to do. It's yeah. dedicated for those one, this one purpose, yeah. for this one area of problems that's out there. Yeah. So that, that's a good point because people could say, why do we need aspect J, for example? I could use what is it called bytecode engineering library, so tweak with the bytecode directly. But AOP gives you a well-defined programming model for tweaking the bytecode exactly. and not just the toolkit. I mean, you can use whatever. You can solve probably any problem with any 
technology yes. and f um, and fiddling around yeah. with whatever fancy stuff you can think of. The thing is that that's not the way the majority of, of software developers want to program yeah. and want to think. If you want to think in, you know, base concerns and cross-cutting concerns right away, when having an architecture and a design in mind, you probably don't then want to think in some bytecode manipulations later on, but yeah. rather in some language constructs yeah. with which you can develop yeah. what, you, what you have in mind. Yeah. There's also load time weaving. So what's, the, what's happening? I think it's Java specific. Uh, well, load time weaving you can do with, with every uh, language that loads uh, bytecode. To, and you can manipulate this bytecode mm -hmm. either. So, uh, to, to, to be specific about this, uh, Java does not, uh, SPECJ does not manipulate the Java source code, but the Java bytecode. Mm -hmm. And you need not do this, you know, for all the bytecode at compile Advanced, time, yeah. but you could do this at load time of each class. Lazily, kind of. Lazily. And for some uh, approaches like JBoss AOP, it's quite natural to weave in stuff at, at, at load time and then make use of you know, changing aspects also at runtime. So that's also possible with some approaches like JBoss AOP. Uh, it's, it can, on the one hand, be uh, a means to make the compile cycles shorter, mm -hmm. like for yeah. aspect J, or on the other hand, I mean to be more dynamic, more or less, not to decide mm -hmm. in advance what aspects should influence your, your your base code. Another way of implementing that stuff is then also the probably the, the proxy and intercept the patterns if you want to go that far. So if you have an object um, that you want to have aspects applied to or applied on, then you can have a proxy for them. The proxy has a way, way to insert interceptors, and then when, when you call, you call on the proxy, the proxy delegates to the interceptors. And the, but that, of course, that's only very cost grained because the only thing you can intercept is the public interface again. That's again something that's done in Spring AOP, for example. So yeah. there's an implementation for Java and there's an implementation for .NET mm -hmm. uh, using this. And there is also an implementation uh, done by Microsoft people, by the Patents and Practices group in mm -hmm. Microsoft okay. that uh, implemented such a uh, a framework, we would call it AOP framework. They say policy injection application block. Yeah, well, because they at some point politically decided that they don't AOP, right? More or less, or they want to be, you know, they, they say that's an, an early step in that direction uh -huh. and they don't want to give the impression that this is a fully fledged AOP. Okay. So it's a transparent proxy approach. So yeah. it, every, every object you want to intercept, you have to create using a factory, mm -hmm. and then there is in between between uh, this proxy and the original object uh, a series of handlers, mm -hmm. and if each of these handlers implements a cross-cutting concern, yeah. if you want. Yeah, the handler is kind of the, the interceptor in, in the other terminology. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, so let's look a little bit at the, at the practical experience of working with, um, with uh, aspects. Um, one thing uh, I think is that what the AOP community talks about quite a bit is that you can apply aspects after the fact. So you have your system, it's finished, it does something, and now after you've finished it, somebody comes up, oh, shit, we have to e uh, add this kind of other feature. So you can add additional features, functionalities, after the system has been designed without changing the system, you just advise it. Is, is, that, is that realistic? Does that work? I mean, it works, of course. You can do that. Technically. But, yeah, the, the question is, is it good when you do this, more or less patching an existing system. I mean, we, we don't want to judge uh, about people who are doing this for some reason, because there might be a reason for this. So you probably have a third party library and yeah. you want to, to change something there yeah. and you use aspects for this. You don't have the source code. You don't, you don't have change. the source code. You, you have to patch something or, you know, things like this. So there can be valid reasons for doing this. But in general, that's not really a good practice to do this, I, I'd say. I'd, I'd rather th say that y you, you treat aspects as you know, first-class citizens, and when you see that there are cross-cutting concerns and you have a, a good reason for wanting this concern not implemented and tangled in your system, then you should use aspects to modularize it. On the other hand, we, we talked about 
product line. So if you have a cross-cutting feature, for example, and you want to have different f variants of these features, it's, it makes a lot of sense to implement it in aspects. Plus, if you have a product family and 99% of your customers want to have the system you know, in a specific way with only a few variations in it, and then there is this one customer who wants something completely different, you probably don't want to pollute the rest of your system or you know, for this one customer, build in another variation yeah, 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 yeah. in some complicated way, yeah. but rather more or less patch the system for this one customer. Yeah. But what you're saying is that in both of the cases you just mentioned, it's probably a good idea to think about aspects when building the system as opposed to, to, to hacking the system afterwards. So, so because that's my impression too, if you want to use aspects well, if you want to exploit their potential, then you need to think of them as you develop the system, as you design the system, just as you think of objects, for example. Yeah, absolutely. That's the best way to, to consider aspects. And of course, then AUP is not the end. So we should do something AUP-ish before implementing something. So if you want to think in aspects, we need aspects before programming. Oh, that's, that's a good point. So what would that be? I mean, well, it sounds obvious, ob aspects and analysis, requirements, but, but what does it mean specifically? So if you can implement aspects, then it would, of course, be nice to have a way at design time when you probably paint some uh, UML diagrams to also be able to express that there is an aspect that interacts with the rest of the system. Mm -hmm. And when you can do this, then you need modeling languages that are more or less aspect aware so that you can design your aspects in architecture and design stage. And then of course, when you want to think of aspects early, then at requirements analysis time, you should be aware of the concept of an aspect. You should not only have in mind that you want to end up with a clean object oriented system because that's what in requirements analysis, you more or less bundle up yeah. your, your requirements to form entities later on in your system yep. and to keep in mind that there are entities that can cross cut other entities helps a lot if you don't later on want to design and implement also aspects. So, so is AO more of a mindset? So because people could say, you know, um, you can do AO with normal OO if you use proxies and interceptors and some of that stuff, but it's important to think AO so that you identify cross-cutting things and modularize them with whatever means your language gives you. So is AO thinking more important than AO programming or whatever? I think it is, yeah. So I think it's, it's very important to just be aware of the fact that there is something that's cross-cutting, that there is the effect that, that some concerns do not fit to, into the decomposition you have chosen and that you try to, to handle them in a way that's, that fits for your certain problem. And, and as we all know, the language you use guides your thinking. So if you have a language that supports AO, then you might, even, then you might start thinking in AO, whereas if you have just an OO language, it's not something that comes easy to, to think in aspects. So, so, the, 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 so the point is that if you have an AO language, the chances that you think in AO are higher than if you have an OO language, although you could also do some AO-ish stuff in an OO, OO language. Yeah, that's true. So if you use a language such as Aspect J, for example, it's, it's very likely yeah. that you, as soon as you find out, okay, there's something cross-cutting, that you try to modularize it as an aspect. Yeah. There are also uh, um, um, aspects in, in modeling. I mean, I've, I've heard the term model weaving. You could imagine aspects, at, as we already talked about, at, at all levels of, of, of artifacts. So if you do, for example, model weaving, you would just express an, an aspect at the modeling level. The same as, for example, in a programming aspect-oriented programming language, define point cuts in your model and yeah. devices and then weave in the, the elements. So just the, the join point model is different but you would do the same thing. Basically, you would weave elements into existing models. And, and, and just to disclose, the three of us are currently working on a research project that kind of uh, looks at these things and we'll maybe have a separate episode about some of these more, let's say, uh, weird or advanced things later. So we just wanted to point this out very briefly. I'm not gonna go into too much detail here. Before we uh, look at, at, at some AO tools at the end of this, of this episode, or maybe at this uh, second part of a maybe double episode if I look at the clock, um, 
one thing we need to discuss briefly are, I think, compile time aspects or developmental aspects. So, um, so what is that? So that's something that's a, a, a very good way of, of starting. Um, so you would then use aspect J during development of, of your application, but you wouldn't have it in your production code, for example. So, but what would it do at development during development time? So you could, for example, um, write an aspect that gives you a, a compiler warning for all your system out print lines you have in your system. So that's very easy to do and ah. that's very effective. Uh -huh. So you could also check for um, certain architecture constraints. For example, pri access, direct access to private fields from outside. No, stupid. Public fields would right, be bad. Something maybe. like that. Or also when you call, for example, um, your database layer from your GUI layer. Oh, so that's something okay. you could, could check for as well and oh, nice. could then have a compile error, for example, if mm -hmm. somebody would do that. Because you have a layer violation or something. That's true. So you could do something like that. And that's a very good starting point for people that use SBCJ for the first time. So maybe they, they fear of having it in their production code, so they could just use it at development time. It also might be politically useful if some operational department tells you, some operations department tells you that you cannot have this strange aspect library in your system. You don't have it in the runtime system, you just use it during compilation. And That's during true, yeah. yeah. I wonder um, about one last thing, uh, and that is, um, if I have a number of aspects that each maybe advise the same join point, how do I, I mean, is there a way of, of finding out in which order they apply? I mean, the point is that if I, if I separate out stuff into aspects and then weave it again, then I think it, it, that there is a complexity involved in, in trying to imagine how it will be woven and what the functionality will be, what the consequences are, what the interactions are. How do you get that? How do you challenge or how do you manage that, that potential complexity? So in general, you have to you know, know yourself or analyze yourself in which order the aspects make sense for mm -hmm one join point if there are more than one that, that target one join point. But then in an in the aspect language like an aspect J you can express a partial order. So if you want oh, yeah. to do, you know, tracing first or or tracing last before probably some other aspects changed the parameters, mm -hmm. then then you can express a, a partial order. So one aspect then can dominate another, which means that this aspect has to be taken first. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, the ordering of the aspects is what the compiler decides mm -hmm. he wants to do. It's undefined, basically. It's more or less undefined. Um, but, but you have means in aspect J to do this by defining this partial order. And there are other aspect language just as that allow you to define more constraints on the ordering, like the compost star family of what? aspect compost star oh, okay. family of aspect languages. So that, that there is a lot of research going on in aspect interference. So yeah. what influence can aspects have on each other? How do I analyze this and how do I solve problems? that might arise from the interference of these aspects. So is, is AOP a big research topic these days? It still is a big research topic. Um, in the States, in Europe and in Asia, there are mm -hmm. research communities everywhere dealing with aspect-oriented software development, so going beyond programming. Mm -hmm. There are, for example, two big European Commission funded projects in, mm -hmm. in Europe that deal with this. There are more and more universities who have researchers working on that topic and it slowly comes also as a teaching topic mm -hmm. into the university. So mm -hmm. I know a lot of, of, of students who already have aspect-oriented programming in some programming course, software engineering courses. So it's, it's getting more and more popular and it's possible to get people from the universities already who know about aspect-oriented programming. And how relevant is it in, 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 in practice for Joe Developer in their real-life projects? Well, I think um, there is a group of aspect languages around frameworks like Spring or yeah. JBoss, where aspects are used uh, but without the, the customer knowing about the aspect. So mm -hmm. things like caching mm -hmm. or... Uh, or tracing, 
or logging are implemented as aspects in those frameworks anyway. Mm -hmm. And those frameworks also allow you to define your own aspects. And I think they are quite popular. Mm -hmm. uh, the, um, the motivation for aspect J is, um, it, it's a little bit more you have to do since you have to convince somebody that you need a new uh, compiler. Yeah. And that's probably a little bit harder if you have to convince your project management. Mm -hmm. So it, uh, I think Aspect J is more currently used at this uh, at groups that are early adopters, yeah. Yeah. not yeah. that much the yeah. you know majority. Yeah. But uh, with the majority, using frameworks like Spring, JBoss AOP, and probably then also this policy. Injection yeah. application block, yeah. this enterprise library yeah. where it's embedded. For them, the barrier is quite low, mm -hmm. and I think it's pretty popular there already. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so before we wrap this up, let's talk a little bit about some of the tools that are around. Uh, we already mentioned a couple of them, so um, maybe let's start with with uh, Aspect J, which is probably the most well, be the most complete and the most sophisticated. Uh, well, more or less implementation of AOP for Java, right? That's true. So it's it's maybe the most famous one also. Yeah, so yeah. It's the, the, the embodiment of AO. That's true. So um, there is lots of tool support for it. So there is a nice Eclipse plugin. You've mm -hmm. got lots of views. So you can even uh, in your base program, you can, you can see in the Eclipse plugin if aspects apply and if yeah. they do, which aspects to apply yeah. and you can go into your aspect and you, you've got syntax highlighting and all those things. And, and in case of AspectJ, um, AspectJ is actually a, an aspect-oriented language. We have new keywords, I guess. We have a, a real new expression language for defining point cards. That's a language extension to, to Java and yeah. you, you, you need a compiler for that as well. Yeah, and that's also because uh, the, the very fine-grained um, uh, um, join point model because it, it happens on compiler level. It supports the, the things we, we've already talked about, like yeah. method call, join yeah. points, method execution, yeah. things like that. Yeah. Spring AOP is different there, right? That's true. So Spring AOP doesn't require you to, to learn a new, a new language. So um, it just generates proxies and handles everything with in the deployment descriptors. And the but Beans XML. File. That's true. So, but in the new version, it, it also includes the, the aspect J point cut syntax. But fundamentally, the join point model is still the public interface of a bean. That's true, yeah. And you can, in the new version, select these point cuts by using the aspect by J. By using the aspect J okay. uh, yeah. point cut language, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. true. Something that I, that I heard was in aspect J5 and also in Spring is that you can, that you can uh, match, you can point cut uh, on, 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 um, on attributes, on, on Java 5 attributes. That also se seems very useful. Like if you have that attribute on a the method, then apply uh, a kind of uh, some kind of advice. You can do both things. You you can use introductions to even introduce new annotations to to classes ah, and okay. methods and yeah. and also attributes. Mm -hmm. And you can also um, in in the point cut match then those yeah. those annotations. So yeah. if if a certain method is is annotated with a special annotation, for example asynchronous, then you want to implement maybe an aspect that that implements um, asynchronous method invocation and mm -hmm. then invokes this this method asynchronously. So, but to some extent, this is, well, a bit cheating, isn't it? I mean, if, if I have to annotate a method with something in order for an aspect to trap it, I like this terminology, um, then, then what's the point? I mean, I thought the idea was to be able to, to, to advise things from the outside without changing the thing you want to advise. It's very useful if you have, for example, a library of, of reusable aspects and you take that library, include it into your project and uh, then just annotate methods, classes, whatever with mm -hmm. the special annotations. And then the, the reusable aspects of your library get automatically applied at those points. Mm -hmm. So okay. for such a thing, that, that's very useful. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah. So we talked about Aspect J a bit. We talked about uh, Spring AOP. I think uh, JBoss AOP is very similar to the Spring AOP, I guess, in that you can deploy uh, interceptors on component interface level, right? Yeah, that's true, yeah. Okay, so we don't need to cover that too, too much. Um, one thing I'd like to cover before we really wrap up is a, re a more or less researchy language called CSRJ, um, because I think it has a couple of very interesting uh, features. Specifically, it, is, it allows you to use collaborations as aspects. 
I think you've worked with it. So can you can you say something about that? Yeah. So Caesar Chase is a, um, a more advanced AO language than than Aspect Chase. So it allows you to to define collaborations. So for example, if if we uh, again think of the the subject observer pattern, if we would implement that in CSHA, we, we would have uh, different roles, like the role subject and the role observer with the different um, operations in it, and then you can bind those collaborations to, to an existing application. So that means that a collaboration of a number of objects is reified into its own type. So a collaboration is a type as opposed to classes just being typed. You can have the collaboration. Yeah, of those. that's true. Yeah. And and then and then of course you can yeah you can also also partially specialize and partially bind those elements of these collaborations. Right. So you could have uh, some base application. You bind the the subject role to a certain class, yeah. and you bind the observer role to yeah. a certain class, and yeah. then you can delegate the methods. And uh, you you've got also the the same uh, point cuts available then in aspect J, for example. Okay. So okay. what you don't have is introductions, but you don't need them because you, you implement this functionality as the collaborations, basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and I also heard that, that uh, CSRJ allows you to dynamically deploy aspects in your program and undeploy them again? You can instantiate your collaborations as, uh -huh. you, as you would instantiate objects in an object-oriented language, and you can deploy them and you can even undeploy them at runtime mm -hmm. then. Mm -hmm. That's interesting because it, it allows you... So, uh, the, Applying an aspect is not something that applies globally to, uh, and you define it during compilation, but rather you can say in that section of the code, I want that aspect to, uh, to, 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 to trap the, the following couple That's of true, yeah. objects. Okay. Um, any other AO language that we, that we missed to talk about? Maybe a couple of uh, pointers to some research languages? There are languages like Arachnet that have features for data flow, point cuts. There are languages like Kamdao, which is an aspect-oriented component model mm -hmm. that also, next to components, has aspects or aspect components that can more or less intercept interfaces for other mm -hmm. components. There are languages that support Distribution beyond mm -hmm. uh, what's possible nowadays, like uh, remote point cuts, mm -hmm. extensions to .NET languages. Mm -hmm. There are other collaboration-centric uh, languages like Object Teams. So there is a whole variety, and you know, extensions to a load, whole lot of languages yeah, like of Ruby, yeah, like yeah. Um, Smalltalk. Yeah. Lots and lots of languages yeah. have. Most of those languages are research languages mm -hmm, mm -hmm. still. Um, uh, universities, of course, play around with language extensions yeah, a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, rarely one of those languages really jumps into the industry because yeah. still nowadays there, there are not that many, you know... Too many people who are, are into this, who are AO experts. Who are AO experts, and once there are a lot of people who are aware of those aspects, then I think there is a chance for other aspect languages to um, to be used in the industry too. The usual genera generational thing, if you want to have a big change in, in, in programming philosophy, it takes a generation of developers. Exactly, it takes about 20 years and yeah. then... so. Uh, AOP is out there for 10 years now, mm -hmm. so there are probably another 10 years to go until they are common in mm -hmm. software development. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, if I haven't forgotten anything really important, then uh, let's wrap this up. Thank you for listening, and thank you, Krista and Iris, for being on the show and making this much more entertaining than if uh, the uh, SE Radio team had tried to come up with that content themselves. Thanks. Thank you, Markus. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Software Engineering Radio. If you want more information about the podcast and all the other episodes, visit our website at se-radio.net. If you want to support us, you can donate to the SE Radio team via the website or you can advertise for SE Radio, for example, by clicking on the Dick Reddit Delicious and Slashdot buttons. To contact the team, please send email to team at seradio.net or if it's specific to an episode, Please use the comments facility on the website so other people can read and react to your comments.
This episode of Software Engineering Radio, as well as all other episodes, are licensed under a Creative Commons license. Please see the website for details. Thanks to Charlie Crow and the Podsafe Music Network for the music used in this show. The song is called Vegas Hard Rock Shuffle. <laughs>